testing. Does my Lori, Lori? Oh. Okay, let's see. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the quarterly Everglades Technical Oversight Committee meeting. We will get started shortly. Thank you. You can make them a panelist from there. No, but um, I have ordered <laughs> over to the attendees sometimes when they want to talk about the federal. Um, but we just asked that be reset. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I did ask. So for your input. All right, so let's get started, everyone. And for those of you who've been hanging in here for a few minutes, thanks for your patience. We're going to go ahead and get this meeting started. Uh, before we get into all the administrative items I'm going to go through, I would like the uh, TOC representatives to please introduce themselves. I'm Julie LaRock from the South Florida Water Management District. Lori Miller, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Loxahatchee Refuge. Donato Surratt, Everglades National Park. And then who do we have, uh, Ed? Ed Smith, Florida Department of Environmental Protection. And Dan. Good morning, Julie. Dan Crawford, Army, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Thank you. And Mr. Barquette, um, if we could hear your voice one more time, please. Uh, yes, you may. Good morning to everyone. I'm John Barquette, the Special Master. Great, thank you. Uh, we're going to go over a few things that are probably less than interesting, but we still want to go through those for you guys. So we are both in person and virtually on Zoom, which hopefully uh, most of you are aware. Uh, for those who are on Zoom as panelists, it means you get to unmute and talk a little more often than the others. Uh, I'm going to call out the agencies, and if you could please pipe in with your name. Uh, first of all, DEP, who else do we have on as a panelist? Good morning, this is Jordan Tedio. This is Penny Holman. Yes, good morning. Hi, this is Charles DeMonico. This is Bill Walker from the Department of Interior. Glad you got in here, Bill. What yeah. about uh, Luke or Mylene? Did you want to say hello? Hello, this is Mylene from the EP. This is Luke from the EP. Thank you. Uh, anybody else from DOI on this uh, panelist list this morning? Oh, good morning, Dilip Shinde from NPS. Okay. Uh, who else do we have? Melody and Judith? Yes, Melody is here from Everglades National Park. And yes, this is Judith Coleman from the Department of Justice, representing all the federal agencies. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Okay, Army Corps. I know, Ken, you've been unmuted, just waiting to announce yourself. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. This is Ken Bradshaw, Planning Division, Environmental for the Corps. 
Okay, do we have anybody else from the Army Corps this morning? Okay. Hey, Julie, um, I know Jim Riley is on, uh, and I know Brooks Moore is working to get on right now. Over. Brooks is actually in my office with me. Aha, uh-huh. okay. I did see Jim sneak Jim onto the lift. All right, thanks, guys. Uh, uh, did I miss anybody who's logged in as a panelist? Eric, I see you here. That's correct. Good morning. Uh, good morning. And then Dan Scheidt, if you could reintroduce yourself, please. Morning, Dan Scheidt, EPA. Okay, I think we've got everyone. Um, I take that back. We have a couple of technical staff. Uh, we did mic checks with you earlier. So, Nenid, I think you're here too, correct? I think so, yes. I think so. All right, so now we've got everyone and we'll move Julie, on. Julie, this with... is Julia Lamonaco as well. Thank you, Julia. Sorry. No worries. All right, I'm going to take a quick look at the TOC webpage, which is a little simpler for me than having an actual shopping list. So on the main TOC webpage, you're going to see the total phosphorus data tables. There are three of them, one for the refuge, one provisional Shark River Slough, and the third one is Taylor Slough and Coastal Basins. Those all run through the fourth quarter of 2022, so they go through December of 22. Also posted on the main page, there are two uh, quality assurance reports. This is water quality data. Uh, The first is an actual document uh, running through all the QA activities, and the other document is an actual Excel spreadsheet that contains the data. Also on the main page is a link for the agenda for today. If you don't already have that, you can get that off the web page. And there's a link for the read-aheads for today, and I would like to, uh, first of all, mention to you all, we typically have a couple of actual narrative reports that we would post for meetings, and we had a minor uh, data delay, and so those two reports will be posted in about a week. Uh, In the meantime, all the slides that we're going to see today are posted, so uh, all the presentations related to... Uh, today's meeting are out there. There's a final water year 22 uh, data table for Shark River Slough. So that only con- includes federal water year 22 data. Uh, we have a few other things um, that are somewhat follow up from prior meetings. So we have two letters that were sent jointly uh, to the special master. One is dated April 17th, the other is dated June 1st. Those are out there. And uh, I'm not going to list off all the presentations, but they are all the ones you're going to see here in a little bit. And then the draft meeting notes from February are also posted out on the web. So hopefully uh, those of you who are here remotely, you can access those as you need to. If you are accessing remotely, if we take a vote on something, we will request public comments. Um, And I can't tell you for sure if we're going to vote on things today, but we'll figure that out as we go. If you are a member of the public, we will take comments for everything else at the end of the meeting. And I'm not going to forget you. Just make sure you raise your hand. Uh, Let's see here. I skipped over the star six. Okay. Uh, If you are joining us remotely, please only use one sound device and mute the others. Also, uh, mute your microphone if you're not speaking. And if you are using a telephone, you can raise your hand in Zoom by pressing star 9. And you can unmute your microphone by pressing star 6. Written public comments. If you do have any written public comments, hopefully you're physically here in the auditorium. It's the only way we can take written public comments today. Uh, 
If you are joining us on Zoom and you feel like you need to use the chat function, please only do that if you're having a technical difficulty. We're unable to take actual comments using the chat function. Uh, and at the end of the meeting, this is for the reps, we're going to be hopefully recapping agenda items. We don't always do that very well. And also, we're going to need to drag out our calendars while you guys are here. So I'm just warning you now uh, so we can figure out when we'll have our next meeting. So I think that's everything for opening business. And we can actually move on to the actual business. So first of all, uh, did anybody want to change anything on the agenda? I'm not seeing anyone jumping up and down in the auditorium or hands raised, so the agenda will move on. Uh, next item is to look at the meeting summary for the February 28th meeting. I hope the reps at least have had a chance to review those. Do we have comments or a uh, motion to approve the meeting notes? No comments from uh, the refuge. No comments from the park. No comments from DEP. And unanimous, no comments from the Corps of Engineers. So as Dan Crawford, I would make a motion to accept the minutes as is. Over. This is Lori. I'll second that. Thank you all so much. All right. Our next item is the fourth quarter calendar year 22 presentation. That's Chelsea Q. Thank you for... Uh, strolling to the podium, Chelsea. So this covers all of the uh, data through the end of December. So some of this will be provisional. Thank you. Hey, good morning, Mr. Paquet, TUC reps. Thank you for having me. So today we have three reports to go through, and some time frames are overlapping. So I'll just try. Okay. So I'll just try to be uh, concise and less uh, repetitive. So the first one is our Could routine. Could you hold just for a second, Chelsea? I think we are have a slight technical thing going on here. Hold on. Uh, can someone who's attending by Zoom let us know if you can see the presentation? It just showed up. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay, Chelsea, you're back on. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So the first presentation is our routine quarter reporting for the fourth quarter of 2022. So it includes the 12 month tracking results for Shaka River through and Taylor through coastal basins ending in October, November, and December. Then we also have a month reporting for individual month of October, November, December for the refuge. So, on this summary table, this top box is for the refuge. And in the second column, the Observe the geometric mean TP concentrations for October, November, and December. 
were consistent below their respective long-term levels. A March stage remained high, and we collect 14 samples in each month. Moving on to Shark River Slough in the middle section. And this is the three months adding on to what year 2022. So we just completed the compliance tests for what year 2022, which um, we had an exceedance. And then um, for the fourth quarter, we go back to the 12 month tracking again. Um, so here, you see the 12 month ending in December include nine months of data in uh, water year 2022 and three months of data in uh, water year 2023. So the 12 month flow with mean TP concentration is still higher than the long term limit. And in the bottom section for Taylor Slough and Coastal Basins, um, as usual, the uh, flow with mean uh, for 12 month period was uh, much lower than the limit fixed at 11 parts per billion. And this slide focuses on the refuge. Here, um, the stack wise sheet background represents the marsh stage in each month. And this red line, solid red line, represents long term level associated with stage and which is the limit that we need to meet. And those blue dots uh, represent the monthly geometric mean TP concentrations of samples we collect in the marsh and need to stay below this red line. So we have um, an excursion in June 2022 and another excursion 20 months earlier so the 36-month uh, average TP geometry mean has 6.8 parts per billion and 2.5 parts per billion lower than the limit. And this slide shows the similar information, just a different way. And so now we will talk about the top three months in our regular reporting. Um, for the outlook with the preliminary data still looks good. Then the geometric mean TP concentrations for the, each month in the next five months were consistent below their long-term levels. And note that since uh, last excursion in June 2022, uh, we have passed the 12 month period without a second excursion. So therefore, we are out of the cloud of exceedance. For Shark River through uh, compliance, for this 12 month period, as I said, uh, it's the 12 month ending December, um, we come back to tracking and the flow in TP concentration is just still higher than the long term limit. Um, just remind us the compliance history, and we just add the last bar representing what year 2022. So we'll um, provide more details in the following presentation on what year 2022 exceedance analysis. And this slide shows daily flow at uh, Shark River through inflow structures. Mm, actually, it's started up showing the total flow discharge in Shark River Slough over the past three years. And this red line represents flow at S334, uh, which routed the flow to South Dade. So all the flow above the red line is the net flow that uh, went into Shark River Slough. So here, um, actually this quarter, you see the increased flow. Um, this is due to the impact of hurricane year. So for this quarter, the total flow in two Shark River Slough was about 225,000 acre feet. Um, 
And this slide just shows the daily flows um, at each individual structure uh, flowing into the Western Shaka River Slough at S12 A, B, C, D from the top to the bottom. And S12 A and B were closed in this quarter. Then S12 C and D uh, passed most of flow to Shaka River Slough, actually 75% of total flow to Shaka River Slough. And this slide displays uh, the daily flow um, discharged into the eastern L29 canal between S33 and S334. So in this second canal, most of the flow come from S33 and S33N. This slide shows uh, similar information, just um, shows the net flow concept. So above this red line is the net flow. And this slide shows the sampling events for the past three year period. So the, this blue bars represent the net flow that went into Shakuru Slough on a bi-weekly basis. So those sign dots represent the TP levels uh, coming with the flow. So this uh, bi-weekly flow and TP concentrations constitute, consist the basis for calculate the 12 month uh, tracking flow with mean TP concentration. So here we see, uh, because these are net flow then uh, used to calculate the flow with mean concentration. So here in the water year 2020, we see uh, seven gaps of no flow. And then 2021, 2022 had a um, continuous flow due to the COP implementation. And also here, the higher flow in this quarter reflects the impact of hurricane year. Then this slide add a string of diamond represent the 12 month tracking flow with mean concentration ending each month and where falls the, on the second y axis the number is 9.8 parts per billion uh, we're reporting for 12 month ending in December and this slide shows the system conditions so it shows the WC3 stage in this solid blue line at the top, and then TP concentrations in yellow dots, and then the flow into Shaka River Slough in this blue shaded area. So again, here we see the Hurricane Ian uh, raised the three stage, this solid blue line um, went into the uh, uh, being above this uh, gray dash line. So uh, the operation went into zone A. Then when stage was high, and you can see TP concentrations were low, as stage was decreasing, then TP concentration was increasing. Move on to Taylor Slew and Coastal Basins. Um, the 12 months flow with mean TP concentration was far below the limit, and the total flow is about 300,000 acre feet for 12 month tracking. And for his historic compliance status, um, the annual flow with mean is far below the long term limit. And the slide display place the daily flow distribution between structures in the last three years here from the top to the bottom. Those shaded area represent flow at S18C, G737, and the bottom S332D. Again here this quarter, we see this uh, higher flow um, is impacted by hurricane year. So for 
flow at individual structures. Um, again, we see most flow um, come from S18C and S332D. Uh, note that these scales are different. So those two uh, flows contribute the most to flow into Taylor Swain Coastal Basin. And this slide presents the flows in and out of S332D flowway. Here the upstream water sources is from S332D pumping shown in this purple shaded areas. And this red line represents the flow carried by S332DX1 into uh, C111 South Detention Area, which is excluded from compliance calculation. And this neon green line represents the flow carried by S328 into Taylor Slough. And looking at the sampling events, flow and TP concentrations, here the blue bars represent the uh, flows and these cyan dots represent TP levels. So over the past 12 month periods, only two events had TP concentrations higher than 10 parts per billion, and most of TP concentrations uh, was below seven parts per billion. Also, we add a string of diamonds representing the 12 month tracking period ending in each month. And this last diamond is the 5.1 parts per billion number we're reporting. So this concludes my presentation. Do you have any question for me? Thank you, Chelsea. Does anybody have comments or questions on the fourth quarter information from Chelsea? Yeah, this is Bill Walker. Um, about five years ago, I developed a regression model to help in the COP effort. And that generally shows that in Sharp River Slough, the concentrations are uh, much more highly correlated with stage than they are with flow. And that model, it, it operates at a shorter time step than a year. And it just kind of occurred to me that it would be useful to compare the, the recent data with those, uh, the predictions of that regression model especially since it looks like you're going to be implementing a lot of measurement, a lot of uh, remedies, and it will, I think it would be useful to have some one you know, way to, to get a better handle on the, on the trends relative to stage because that would provide a more accurate uh, representation than the compliance equation. Thank you, Bill. I don't know if you're offering to do that, or if, uh, <laughs> well, or or yeah. if your uh, client is going to have you. Well, do that it's for up us. to my client. I think it makes sense to do. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah, we do recall uh, that information, by the way. So thanks for reminding us. Any other comments or questions for the fourth calendar quarter of 2022? This is John Barquette. Can we just go back to slide 13 for a second? Okay, this one. Thank you. And the long-term limit is not shown on this slide. Is that right? No, this is just the, the blue diamond that just the... 12 month flow rate and mean. So it does not have the long term limit on here. So those sign dots, just the bi weekly TP uh, concentrations. But the, the blue diamonds, would anything over 7.6, and I realize that's measured at, at the end of, the, of September of each year, but just looking at the pattern, it, it doesn't look like if. There might be a couple, but it looks like the trend line for the last couple of years has been pretty consistently for every 12-month period over the long-term limit. Is that, am I reading this correctly? Um, 
In other words, all of those blue diamonds are, are all or most of them are greater than 7.6? Um, I have... Well... Not, I oh. have another... <laughs> This is Dole again. Um, I think you have another slide that shows that information, compares the 12 volts forwarded mean with the limit. And the limit hasn't been constant. Yeah, in the last, I don't know, several months, it's been 7.6, but the limit increases when, when the flows are lower. So I thought you showed a slide that had that information in it. Chelsea, is that on the next slide, or maybe it's more obvious in your next presentation? Yeah, I have another I, I can wait. I was just trying to get an idea of how consistently there's been a monthly concentration calculated that's greater than the long-term limit. And again, I realize that you measure compliance based on September, but just curious to see what it looked like along the way the last couple of years, three years. I guess if we've had exceedances the last two years, it's going to be greater than the long-term limit most of the time anyway. I realize that. Uh, but it seems like the pattern is just continuing for the first three months of this year. Well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to look at the comparison mo uh, monthly. And I don't know, slide 16 has... Uh, no, that's for Taylor Slew. I'm not sure, Bill, what you're talking about. Which slide? Uh, actually, Bill, I think, was talking about some other information. Uh, and uh, Mr. Barquette, I'll take a look at the data tables that we post on the website because some of that information that you're asking about might be included there. But uh, trying to slice and dice the end of the water year versus these 12-month moving averages is a little uh, tricky. No, that, that's okay. I was really looking at 24 months, 36 months, 48 months, just to sort of get a, a sense of each month what it looked like. But, but that's all right. Keep moving. I'm, I, I'm sorry for the interruption. You can interrupt any time, sir. Yeah, Mr. Barkett, we um, I have another uh, following presentation talking about um, what year 2022 exceedance analysis. Um, so it's also talk about this historic compliance uh, patterns. So what about <laughs> you hold the question, then we can talk about after that presentation. Very, very good, very good. Yeah, I've, I've taken a look at that. I'll look forward to you presenting that. Very good, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, are we ready for our next agenda item? This is relatively short, but uh, Chelsea's next presentation is the actual final water year 2022 compliance results. So that's October of 21 through September of 22. Okay, this presentation presented the uh, final Shark River Slough uh, compliance results for water year 2022. So we're actually backing up three months from previous presentation, which was the fourth quarter. So this actually go back to the period ending in September 2022. So this uh, data covers the period from October 2021 to September 2022. So I've presented this summary table in the February TOC meeting. So after receiving the final flow data uh, from uh, USGS on S12 flows and uh, also the district side on S33 and S334 flows. So this mid portion of the table was updated for Shark River Slough. So this uh, flow numbers has changed slightly, but uh, the compliance results uh, remains the same. 
So for water year 2022, the 12 month flow mean TP concentration is 10.2 parts per billion and exceeded the long-term limit is 7.6 parts per billion. And the total flow is uh, over 1 million acre feet and the percent of sampling events greater than 10 parts per billion was at 50% higher than the guideline. This slide shows just the same information I just talked about in the middle portion. Again, this for the historical compliance status. Um, we'll talk more about in my next presentation on the uh, what are your 2022 exceedance analysis. And this slide displays the daily flows at uh, inflow structures. Again here, this uh, red line represents the flow at S334 routed to South Dade. So only flow above this red line is the net flow that sent into Shaka River Slough. So here we see what year 2022 had a seven gaps with zero flow to Shaka River Slough. Then 2021, 2022 had a continuous flow because the um, time immaterial flow formula necessity continuous flow. And this just shows the same flow information displayed in a different manner. Again, there's also the same flow information. Uh, we also see the same net flow concept. So this slide shows the um, sampling event uh, flow in blue bars and TP concentrations in sign dots. So here you can see that for these uh, past three years, the peak of TP concentrations are similar, but the net flow is different. As I said, what year 20 had um, a huge gap of no flow and 2021, 2022 had a flow and carried those high TP concentrations into the annual flow within concentration calculation. And for what year 2022, you can see TP concentration remained uh, quite high, around 10 parts per billion from March to about the end of the water year, September 2022. And this slide also shows the 12 month tracking um, flow with mean TP concentration and in, in each month. Again, this uh, last diamond is the number 10.2 parts per billion we're reporting for water year 2022. And for the system condition, I'll talk about more in the uh, next presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Any comments or questions here? I don't see any heads nodding in the room and I do not see any raised hands. So we'll move on to our next agenda item. Our next agenda item, uh, also from Chelsea, is related to uh, what we've looked at so far on uh, water quality conditions related to Shark River Slough for water year 2022. Thank you, Julie. This presentation provides exceedance analysis for water year 2022. So we follow the same line of thoughts at the water year 2021 exceedance analysis. And the slides are similar and the conclusions are the same. Just reminder, 
that we are discussing these values, the 12 month period from October 2021 to September 2022. And if we had an exceedance with flow vitamin TP concentration at 10.2 parts per billion, uh, which is 2.6 parts per billion higher than the long term limit. So we will perform the evaluations based on these four conditions. So the first two conditions are required by consent decree, determining whether there's data errors or occurrence of extraordinary natural phenomena. If the exceedance is not a cost by these two factors, then we explore the more elements. So we look at the system operations and upstream conditions. So in the end, we identified the major drivers to compliance results. So when dealing with data errors, we examine flow and water quality data. So for flow data, we examine whether there's a missing or abnormal flow values. So for water quality data, we examine whether there's missing samples or um, qualified samples. So if any of these issues occurred and they change the compliance results, then we would deem data errors as the cause of exceedance. So for water year 2022, we find no missing or um, abnormal flow values. So for water quality data, we found five missing sampling events. So we performed a sensitivity test. So using a substitute samples at S33N or S12D to replace the five missing samples of S333, then the annual flow with mean TP concentration decreased 0.2 or 0.3 parts per billion. So the compliance, remotes, re, the compliance results remain unaffected because of the exceedance of 2.6 parts per billion and these small changes didn't move the compliance results. So therefore, we conclude that uh, data error is not a cause of exceedance. So were there occurrence of extraordinary natural phenomena? We examined the rainfall in WCA3A. So this figure displays the monthly rainfall compared against with 30-year average. So here on the top, this uh, blue boxes represent rainfall surplus, and those red boxes represent rainfall deficits. So uh, most rainfall or significant rainfall fell in the latter half of September 2022, and in most months, rainfall had deficits. For system operations, we examined the three A stages. So looking at the water year 2022, um, at this right-hand side, you can see this solid blue line represent a WCA3 stage. So when this blue line fell below this blue dash line, the operation is in zone B, where uh, Tamim Trio flow formula controls the releases from uh, 3A to Chakra River through. So in water year 2022, the 3A stage, uh, stayed 80% of time in zone B. So this is a low stage zone. So despite low stages, substantial flow has delivered to Chakra Rasu, so over 1 million acre feet. That got us the 7.6 parts per billion limit. So because there is no abnormal conditions observed, we concluded that 
extraordinary natural phenomena is not a factor. So what there an upstream influence? So the next two slides talk about the upstream conditions. So this slide depicts the upstream influ inflow points to WCA3A. So we separate the inflows into two groups, western inflows and eastern inflows. So the western inflow, hold on, let me get the point. Okay, so the west inflow includes um, discharges from S8, partial STA56 fl uh, flow, outflow, and flow from S140, S190, carry discharges out of the western basin. So th those west inflows traverse through marsh, and the marsh TP concentration was extremely low uh, ranging from five to seven parts per billion. So our focus is on eastern inflows. So the eastern inflows include the STA outflows um, passing through S-150, uh, discharging into 3A via S-11s and route through WCA-2. S9 and S9A serving Western Broward County, and also S340 this is the interior structure on Miami Canal. So there are two structures along Miami River Canal inside S3, uh, 3A, S339, and S340. So usually these two structures are closed, but when stage was very high, these two, two structures could open and sending flow to, flow to S-150 area. So I included this flow also. So all of these eastern inflows um, connect to the downstream S-33 and S-33N and could impact the TP concentrations downstream and the southeastern portion. So this slide focuses on the upstream influence by comparing TP concentrations between downstream and upstream. So here we select S33 and S33N as a downstream and the upstream, upstream eastern inflow as the upstream. As I said, because these two are more likely connected by the eastern border canals and the eastern inflow could have more direct impact on the, uh, the downstream. So here we see is weekly grab TP samples at S33 in the fuchsia dots and S33N in yellow dots. And there are distinct intra-annual patterns you see high TP concentration in the middle of the year, April to July, and then low TP concentrations in the other month. And those intra-annual patterns is controlled by stage. Now adding a solid gray line represent the upstream eastern inflow here we can see at the top, this table shows the annual fluid mean in upstream and downstream. So on the annual basis, the upstream downstream TP concentrations are basically equivalent. However, on a weekly basis, on this figure you can see that often the downstream TP concentration could be higher than upstream. You see those dots are above this solid gray line. And when does this happen? Under low stage conditions. So in this shaded area, S33 headwater was 
below 9.2 feet. And then we look at the ratios between downstream and upstream. So those seven bars represent when downstream was higher than upstream. Again, the happens when stage was low, as three three had a water below 9.2 feet. So what does this tell us? So even though the downstream and the upstream are hydraulic connected, in terms of TP dynamics, they're decoupled, which means the downstream TP concentration is controlled by stage, while the upstream TP concentrations has its own system. So here you see downstream high TP concentrations. It's not caused by upstream, instead by low stage. Also, similarly, when you see downstream had low TP concentrations, it's not caused by upstream either, but by high stage. For example, in early water year 2018 and water year 2021, the stage was extremely high and it pushes TP concentrations to five to seven parts per billion downstream. So based on these two systems are decoupled, we conclude that upstream influence is not a factor that cause high TP concentrations downstream and causing the exceedance. So what else was going on in the system? So the remaining slide will focus on understand what might have caused the exceedance. So we examine the relationship between stage and TP concentrations and flow under low stage. So this slide focuses on flow and the low stage. So low stage is the period in those gray shaded area. And flow, the, this here is the net flow from WC3A to Shark River Slough. It's shown in this uh, blue shaded or purple shaded areas. So I, wa I want you to pay attention to when these two shaded area crossed together. So this represented the flow under low stage. So here you can see that what year 2018, there's near zero flow, no cross area. And 2020, there's some flow in this crossed area. And 2019, substantial flow. And 2021, 2022, had highest flow because of the implementation of Tamiyam trail flow formula. And those exceedance years shown in the red color marked by the highest flow under low stage. So this slide shows the flow volume under low stage conditions. So here again, the same thing, the net flow from 3A to Chakra River Slough below 9.2 feet. Here on the y-axis uh, represents the S33 headwater, and the x-axis representing the net flow to Chakra River Slough from WCA3A at or below each stage. For example, here at the top at 9.2 feet, and those ending point of each line represent the flow of each year discharged at or below 9.2 feet. And those corresponding to the numbers of the last column in this table. So as we move down, the stage decreases. Then at the bottom at 7.6 feet, again, these flows represent the flow discharged at or below 7.6 feet. And what we can see that for 2018, near zero flow below 9.2 feet. 
And for 2020, the flow discharged at 8.7 feet. 2019, flow discharged at 8.3 feet. So it's moved lower stage. And for what year, 2022, 2021, the flow started below 7.6 feet. Because at 7.6 feet, we can see already there's flow. So here for the past three exceedance years, they had the highest flow and the low stage over the last 30 years. So when you have mouth flow and the low stage, even the TP concentration are same level, but mouth flow multiply combined with these high TP concentrations add more weight to the annual flow with mean TP calculation leading to higher annual flow weighted mean. So this slide focuses on the long-term trends over the long-term limit period. So it presents five-year average data instead of annual data for individual years in the previous slides. So the purpose is to provide a broader perspective beyond individual years, which um, is more can be influenced by the dry year or wet year rainfall patterns. So the, in this top figure, it represents two flows. These pink dots represent the Shark River Slough total flow in the five-year average. And these purple dots represent the flow and the low stage, which is a subset of the total flow. And both flows shows increasing trend, but with the flow and the low stage have a sharper trend. Now moving on to this bottom figure, these pink squares, squares represent the long-term limit and this uh, purple square represents flow weighted mean. So due to the increasing trend in Shark River Slough total inflow, the long-term limit has a decreasing trend. So increasing flow, lower long-term limit. This is based on appendix A equation. So these two pink lines are directly connected to each other. Now looking at the flow weight and mean TP concentration, so it has a decreasing trend till 2018. Then after this inflection point, it has an in increasing trend. Because these two trends are canceled each, each other out. So um, statistically, there's no significant trend over the long-term period. And also this, see this, um, these two purple lines, they are connected. So the mall flow under low stage increases the annual flow women TP concentration. And that's why they both have the increasing trend. So now focus on the last five years, the shock river through inflow consistently above, is consistent above one million acre feet. And for the long-term limit, it decreased 0.5 parts per billion. And for flow weighted mean, it also increased 0.5 parts per billion. So now, now let's step back, look at, think about this. The increasing flows due to optional change has altered the compliance dynamics resulting two opposing trends, lower long-term limit and higher flow weight and mean. So this change has contributed not only consistent exceedance, but also much larger exceedance. That's what we see in what year 2022 
2.6 parts per billion. So we've evaluated the exceeding, uh, what year 2022 exceedance and arrived at these conclusions. Data errors is not a factor. Extraordinary natural phenomenon does not appear to be a factor. Upstream influence continues not to be a factor. And the major drive is the local effect, localized effects. The high TP concentrations associated with the low stage conditions and the more flow during these periods carries high TP concentrations. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, I did want to go back and just mention uh, or reiterate to folks on slide five where we were talking about missing data. I know we've spoken about it before here at the TOC, but I kind of want to remind everyone uh, we missed five sampling events because we had an unsafe sampling platform at the S333. Uh, I also am interested in some additional information on one of your slides, Chelsea, but maybe someone else has the same question. So why don't I ask if uh, any of the representatives here have comments or questions for Chelsea. Hey, Chelsea. Good presentations. I'm Donato Sorato with Glades National Park. I do have a few questions on the several slides. I'll start by following up with Julie's um, statement a moment ago. Can you talk a little bit more about the substitutes? I wasn't really following that during your discussion. I see on the slide it says 10 or 9.9, .9, but then it says that you substituted five values. What, what did you substitute them with? Mm, let me see. This one? Correct. Could you repeat your question? I, I wasn't following. What did you substitute the five samples with? I see here something about 10 or 9.9, .9, but I'm not clear. If, what, what did you substitute the samples with if they were absent? Okay. Um, because we had five missing sample collection at S333 due to unsafe sampling platform. So for just for a sensitivity test, we use S33N data to replace those five missing samples in the annual flow women calculation. So when you plugged in S33N, because you had originally the 10.2 parts per billion, didn't include the missing samples. So now we include the missing samples using S33N data, and the flow with me is 10 parts per billion. And this also happened in December and January when flow was very high. So when you had missing data, you exclude lower TP concentration, good water quality. So when you include substituted samples, the TP concentrations was lower. So, I'm sorry, can you, so it says 333 North or S12D. Did you do two different sensitivity Yeah, right? two okay. sensitivity tests. One is using S33N as substitute, and then we get the annual flow we mean 10 parts per billion. So if we use S12D as substitute, then the annual flow we mean is 9.9 .9 parts per billion. Okay, thank you. Can I go to slide nine? Slide nine? Yes. It's a, it has an animation. It can tell me. Yeah, the whole slide. Go, yeah, finish the whole animation. There you go. Thank you. That's too far. Uh, which one? This one? Yeah, I guess that works. All right, so you described, um, bless you, no transport happening basically from the eastern structures that have been aggregated and all of the signal basically removed from the individual structures. 
to conclude that there are no upstream influences um, mm -hmm. on compliance. Um, when I look at this slide, I see this, even with it aggregated, um, called Eastern Inflow TP. And when I see these, it seems like there are periods when those are higher um, than the actual concentrations observed at 333 and 330 in. I'm wondering, have you guys investigated the potential for transport, particularly during these higher stages, when water is moving pretty rapidly through the system? And then following that, the system dries down and flows, slow down with the drying process. Have you evaluated any concepts of, 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 of this transport that could be happening between the peaks that we're seeing here that you're pointing at and saying are not influenced by upstream influences? Has that been considered and evaluated? And if so, can you share that evaluation? <laughs> I have a hard time to hear your question. So how about we investigate the, the transport? Yeah, so have we invested the transport? Transport and deposition. So deposition. there's a period of time when these straws are, structures are flowing, and you show in, these, in this slide that those concentrations can be higher than what we're seeing downstream at the 333s. And my question is, have you investigated this potential for deposition that could be occurring between these peaks that we're seeing to actually contribute to the loads in these spikes that we're seeing? OK. I really have a hard time to hear you. So have we? OK, I'll talk louder again. <laughs> so my question is, with regards to these eastern inflow TP concentrations that are represented by this gray line transposed on top of the concentrations for the 333 and the 333 north, have you investigated? these higher concentration times with respect to tr potential transport south towards the 333s. And then as the stages decline and we see the flows slow down, have you looked at the potential for those concentrations to be deposited over time and then be resuspended into these sediments to contribute to the spike in concentrations we're seeing or peak in concentrations we're seeing pretty much cyclically now? Yes. Yeah, but I still have a hard time to uh, comprehend it. But anyway, so what you said, have we investigated transport, deposition, and all these internal process? Correct. Well, yes. I didn't get into internal processes, but just the transport and deposition part of that internal. I wasn't trying to go down the biology road, but just those, those physical processes. So, Donato, uh, I think the first part of your question, the answer is no. Um, I'm hearing in the second or third time you asked your question some items, I believe, as I understand it, that the S333 working group is investigating. Um, so perhaps uh, we, we might hear we're, more about that not, later on. We're not looking at the S11s for our study. You guys are aggregating across S11s, S9, um, 340, and not considering the stuff coming from the West. We're not doing that, so I'm wondering if you guys, because you're concluding here that there are no external influences, have you actually done this evaluation to understand the, their contributions to this signal that we're seeing here? That goes beyond the S333 characters, study, sediment characterization study we're doing. Got it. Thank you. I do think that's something we plan to look at. You mean split? The S9, S340, you are talking about how we combine these structures together? That is one of the concerns I have about this approach, but that is not what I'm asking about. I'm asking about there's timing that's happening, and you're saying that it's disconnected, but things are happening before the spikes happen. And I'm wondering what evaluation has been made of that to conclude that there are no longer upstream influences. And this is the second year you've concluded this. Uh, Donato, I think one thing Chelsea may not have mentioned today, I believe, and Chelsea, you're going to have to help me again, 
The gray line actually includes the entire week prior to uh, the sampling dots that you see here. But I don't think it necessarily includes what you're asking. I feel like that should be incorporated into a discussion of no upstream influences um, if you're going to make that conclusion. That's, it's, to jump to this conclusion without having done such an evaluation seems a little premature for me. Uh, Stuart, did you want to make a comment or are we good here? So Donato, I, I don't doubt that that is a good question. One of the things that we thought about is that um, if you look, hmm? I hear myself in the echo. Okay. So um, one of the things that you can take a look at also is that when the stages are higher, you've got two systems that are going on. High stages, more water is moving into the marsh, even from the eastern inflow. You've got a lot more of that water at those concentration levels, which are low, that are moving water into the marsh. So the transport mechanics are probably some part of it coming into the canal, but there's a good deal of it that's pushing into the marsh as well. So what fraction of that would actually make it into the marsh versus the canal? I, I think we've discussed it internally. We think that probably a lot more is making it into the marsh. Then you get the system when you're under low stages, a lot of that water coming through those structures is not pushing into the marsh, it's staying within the canal system. So it, the patterns vary from year to year. If you look at water year 2018, you had some upstream concentrations, which, you know, by magnitude compared to those purple, purple dots, they are a lot higher, but the stages are also very high. So how much of that material moved into the marsh as opposed to the canal? You move into water year 2019, you're seeing relatively the same concentration levels. There's really not much variation between upstream and downstream. But then when you get to the sum, those months in that gray area, you see those concentrations spike. So if we would have seen much higher concentrations in the upstream here of a higher order of magnitude, maybe that theory might hold. When you go into um, this year, you are seeing some higher concentrations. When you move into this year, you see a couple of spikes. You come over here into this year, you're, not, you're kind of seeing they're somewhat around the same level. A lot of that high stages, concentrations bouncing around the same time, but then you get spikes. So you're seeing some, some different patterns there, and I think you're right. There's probably more that needs to be investigated into it. But I, we've discussed it internally, and we think a lot of that is during those high stage months uh, or periods of time, water is pushing into the marsh, right? And I think that is something that maybe for the working group, that when we get into phase two, maybe we should be looking at that expanded geographic area of, of transport and, you know, answering the question, where is it coming from? Thanks, Stuart. Okay. So I think it, my next question is on slide 13. No, I'm wrong. Slide 14. So slide 13? 14, you got it. Um, no, it was the other slide. The one with your five-year trends. Yeah, that's 14. On my presentation, it says 14. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's probably... Do you mean this one? Oh, yeah, yours says 13. All right, so can you talk a little bit about what statistic you're applying to this five-year trend? And I, I ask that because when we deal with HESLs for trend analysis, it normally suggests that we should have at least 10 years um, to have enough power for the test. So I'm, I'm just curious what test is being applied here. I didn't say it loud enough again. I'll try again. So... Normally when we're doing trend tests um, using the Hessel's approaches, um, they normally require us to have a minimum of 10 years to have enough power for the test to detect a statistical trend. And I see you're using five years. So my question is, what statistical test are you applying? Hey, Donato, this is Nanette. Hey, Nanette. 
Uh, we use the Kindle towel and we actually use the um, full data set. So if you're getting a P value, okay, that is less than your uh, significance level, uh, you have sufficient power to detect a trend. So if you take a look at the P values, they're below the 0.1 confidence level. And uh, obviously we have sufficient power to detect the trend because the trend is statistically significant. Okay, so you did the Kindle Tau test, is what you said? Yes. Saying? Okay, thank you. I yield back to you, Julie. Okay, Dilip, you oh. have patiently had your hand up all the time. <laughs> I, I don't know if you right. still have a question or a comment, or Donato's uh, looking around like he's wondering. A little bit of everything. Um, first of all, uh, go back to the time series. Uh, detail uh, time Bill, series. Bill, uh, please yeah. raise your hand. I actually called on Dilip. Oh, I'm sorry. Raise uh, I have a yeah, this is Dilip. Uh, I have a question on this same slide, and I think on the... Uh, Chelsea, you mentioned net flow to SRS from WCA3A. So, oh no, go back. Yeah, net flow from WCA3A to SRS. Now go to slide 30. So is this one? 13, slide number 13. Uh, Are you saying one, three, delete? This one? One, three. One more. Because the number you have is different from my, but. Yeah, we're having a minor slide so numbering 13. issue. Is yeah. One? So I just want to understand when you say net flow to SRS from WCA 3A. Mm hmm. Do you mean to say all this water is coming from 3A and how was it determined or separated okay. out from the net flows uh, going into SRS? Okay, um, you know the, this, the third column, that's a flow to Shaku River Slough. So this is the compliance flow. So basically it's uh, S12, plus S333, then plus S356. But here, the net flow from uh, to Shark River Slough from WCA3A is S12 plus S33, then subtract S334. So S334 is the flow sent to South State. So it didn't go into Shark River Slough. So in our compliance flow weighing concentration calculation, it actually uses the net flow. So it's the flow subtract S334. Yeah, uh, well, uh, what I'm trying to understand, you are saying from 3A. So does it mean it's solely coming from the 3A marsh? 3A means S12 plus S33, excluding S356. Okay, so you are referring to the discharge locations, basically. Yes, it, this is just in contrast to the compliance shock reverse flow. Okay, thank you. All right, Bill Walker has his hand up. He properly has his hand up. What you got, Bill? Uh, Bill, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, I didn't. Um, I think if you went back to the, looks like the previous slide, it just showed the uh, daily correlations time series. No. Yeah. Well, I think one thing to consider is that we would expect a lag between 
the uh, inflow concentrations or loads and the outflow concentration. Water stored in the marsh, taken up and released by the uh, vegetation and soils. So it, to me, it suggests doing this type of analysis on a longer time frame and maybe going back further. Another thing is that to me, it's hard to really believe that there's no correlation between the inflows and the outflows. If we go back to say 2007 or even before that, before the long-term limits were in effect, the, the data were uh, much higher, you know, pretty much consistently higher than the limit. So there is a trend, if you look at it on a long-term long time frame, uh, there is a trend in the uh, compliance, making it harder to meet compliance or easier to meet compliance. You're closer, in other words, you're closer to compliance now than you were back in 2007. And another thing that was suggested, I think, by Donato is, I guess, it would also be useful to look at the concentrations at the individual inflow structures because some of the structures are more directly hydraulically correlated or connected with S333 and in particular S9. So I think, you know, like, yeah, so getting resolution spatially and looking at a longer time frame is what I suggest. But I think this is an excellent analysis, but these are just some ideas on how we might improve it. Thank you, Bill. All right, Lori has uh, raised her literal hand, I guess. <laughs> right, right, right. Lori with the refuge. Okay, so I'm trying to put a couple of things together. Um, Chelsea, can we go to slide eight? And I don't know if you can zoom in on the map or not. Can you, oh, slide eight. Eight. The, eight. Yeah, the one yes. with the map. Thank yes, you. Yes, one with the map. Can you point maybe even with your cursor where the S150 is? Here. Where's your cursor? Yes. Okay. No? Can you see that? Yeah. That's S-150? Okay, so you've taken a... corner. Okay, I got you. All right, so that's, that's uh, handling the EAA STAs. Okay. All right, can you then go to slide 11, please? Is this the real slide 11? <laughs> yeah, my slide 11. Next <laughs> one? Uh, no, mine's the one that has the effects of on compliance. That's going to be okay, one um, after, I think. This? Yes. Okay, so it says uh, understanding what might have caused the exceedance, and I see we have the relationship between the L67 alpha on the headwater. So L67 alpha then is handling, I guess, maybe back to the map on 8. Can you show where the inflows are coming into the L67? And what waters are... What a water? Okay, yeah. sure. What waters are moving through there? So this is the L67A canal. Right. Okay. The water could come, some water from these upstream inflow structures, some because they are connected with the border canal. So some seep to the marsh, some could uh, trip, uh, trickle down here. Then also S9 and S9A, and also flow from S340. Um, but these canals are interacting with the marsh. And also, there's internal lake or something very, this uh, a pond of water in front of S3, uh, S151. So this was the center of Shark River Slough in old days. So that's why all of these discharges goes into this inner lakes 
And as inner lakes also receive water from marsh when there's no discharge, then the water goes to uh, passing, uh, goes down to L67A canal. So you're not <clears throat> really assuming that that's any part of an upstream flow, right? You've kind of taken that aside out of your eastern inflows? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hey, Chelsea, this is Donato again. I want to follow up on the LEAPS question. Um, my slide 14, I think it's your 13. And your asterisk, and, and you describe net flow from 3A to Shark River Slough is computed by blah, blah, blah. Um, are you now considering 3A to include the L67A canal when you say this? Is this the narrative that you're creating? or I'm, I'm lo at a loss at why you call it flow from 3A when we have the L67A canal as a direct transport. And Stuart just came up and described how when we're at low stages, it's just the canals. So why is it named from 3A? Are you c including L67A into 3A now? Um, <laughs> still, I lost your question. But this is just basically, if you look at um, the two flow paths that come into the structures, you've got water that comes from the S12s, S333. So what does it say in the consent decree? It says inflow structures from 3A. So we're using the wording interchangeably. It doesn't mean anything more than that. It just means that's the pathway in which water is traversing from 3A, which includes the canals, the marsh and the canal, the boundary is 3A. So that's consistent with, you know, what the language that's described in the consent decree. And then the reason why they're excluding in that starred column in the net flow for the other route of water that comes from 3A, which goes to 356, is that those concentrations are stable. And so they want to show the, the route that comes from water of, on the S12s and 333 structures, what is the pattern that's being influenced by more flow under low stage? So that's the way they constructed this slide. It doesn't mean anything more than that. Okay, you see the interpretations that's happening, though, and, and I appreciate linking it back to the consent decree. Um, I, I think we need to do something to make it a little more clear that we still have this transport route of the canal. Thank you, Stuart. Okay, well, yeah, it's buried it's buried within it, right, is the water that's coming in the L67A, those columns are representing that you're having more influence in those periods of time under those stages, which is it's directly implying that it's because of lower stages in the L67A with more water flowing. I'm just not sure who captures that that's not immersed in this thing like this in the depth when they just read the slide. Okay, we'll we'll work on improving that in the future, but that that should be the interpretation of this slide. Thank Stuart, you. can you say that again <laughs> about the L67, the lower stages in L67? So the purpose of the slide was to show how much more water is coming from uh, excluding 356, which is a different route of water coming from 3A, which is technically a term that's used in the consent decree uh, for Shark River Slough compliance calculations when you add up all the flows. So we're just looking at the flows that come through the structures that are on the S12s and S333 structures. And we know that under lower stages, we're seeing more flow volume passing through those structures which some of it could be from the marsh, but probably a lot of it is being conveyed through the canal because you've got low stages in the water conservation area 3A, but you've got this conduit that's running down the canal. So what it could imply that more of that water, when you, when you uh, say how much is coming from the marsh and how much is coming from the canal, it, it does somewhat imply that a lot of it is being transported down the L67A, which is within the boundary of 3A. Okay. Okay, I just want to make sure I understood. Okay. That helped a lot. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Dan Scheidt, you have your hand up. 
Uh, thank you, Julie. Um, could we I need to ask you to please speak up a little bit, if you don't mind. Okay. Could we go to slide 14, please? I heard you say something about the working group. Uh, oh. Sorry, slide 14. Now you know I can't hear you very well, Dan. <laughs> yeah, could you hear me better now? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm a little curious about the statement, upstream influence continues not to be a factor. Should this be eastern Yes, yeah. upstream influence. Yes, it should. Uh, and keep in mind, some years ago, uh, it was discussed that the Western inflows are really not part of the consent decree. So, typically, when we come here, we're going to look at what's part of the consent decree. Well, I guess then I'll I'll follow that with a question. Has anybody looked at whether S140, L28, IS190 have any influence on phosphorus concentration of S12A and S12B? Hey, Dan, this is Stuart Van Horn. I'm going to take that question again. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, what Chelsea mentioned in her presentation, uh, which was brief and maybe it wasn't caught, and, and we have shown it in previous times. We show it in the South Florida Environmental Report. DEP writes a chapter on water conservation area 3A and the TP rule. So Chelsea didn't reference the uh, South Florida Environmental Report or the work that's being done to track the TP rule, but she mentioned that the concentrations are very low. I forget the exact range, but I think she said five, six, seven parts per billion. We know there's a gradient of concentrations that are in 3A from northwest down towards the south. The concentrations are higher in the monitoring network that's measuring the phosphorus in the surface water column, column that's in uh, <clears throat> the northwest part. So those are flows coming from STA 5.6, and also those flows coming from S140 and S190. And we obviously see it in the halo of the vegetation um, but once you get past that vegetation halo, the concentrations in the remainder part of the network that, t that um, DEP set up to track the TP rule, those concentrations in the surface water column are all showing lower. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one, one could conclude that, um, yes, S140 and S190, and we've stated this in previous TOC meetings and probably in other forums that it is, it is definitely a water quality standard issue for water conservation area 3A, those inflows, uh, as a state water quality standard issue, but it seems to be decoupled from being a direct uh, impact or consequence upon the S12s and the calculation or the compliance regime in which we're tracking when we look at cause and effect um, for these elevated uh, flow weighted mean concentrations. And this has actually been discussed and it's been in the special master hearings about those Western inflows. So it, it was investigated and the special master and Judge Moreno had said that those are water quality standards for 3A. It doesn't seem to be an impact on Shark River Slough. And so, you know, are there still, still some effects or is there something going on with the S12A? Well, it's the same question. Why, why do we having elevated concentrations in these uh, certain stage conditions in front of um, S333? We know that S12A, the concentrations, they go really, really high. They go in 60, 70, maybe even 80 parts per billion when it's very dry, stages are low, but that water is not flowing through S12A. When it finally does open, when the closure period is, is uh, relaxed and the S12A and S12B structures can be opened, those concentrations immediately shoot back down again. So we have not seen any influence from those structures operating under those low TP concentrations that have had any impact on, um, on the compliance regime in calculating these flow weighted mean concentrations. They're a small percentage of flow, and they're also, when they do flow, they're very, very low concentrations. They're on the order of six, uh, they probably average six, if I remember correctly, the S12A and S12B between those two structures when they are flowing during their open season. 
Uh, thank you, Stuart. A couple more questions just to clarify the same statement. Continues n not to be, um, I guess, uh, since when? Um, going back in time? We've been uh, looking at the, Chelsea has been doing these presentations for a number of years, years and uh, I have to commend her. She's been doing an admirable job in this. Um, we, we've been looking at these upstream concentrations in this typical fashion, the, the uh, statement. Uh, I don't know how many years we've been doing this, but it's been a few years in which, a couple years, in which we've been um, looking at these upstream concentrations and um, seeing that, well, number one, we're looking on the eastern inflows to see what, what levels they're at. So are they, you know, another thing you have to remember, and this is part of what I was going to say, is that um, the S-150 is taking water from STA-3-4, large portion of that, and then you've got S-7, which is going down the uh, water conservation area two-way side through the S-11 structures, mixing with marsh water. So when you look at those structures and what their individual flows are, they are well below what Q-Bell levels are. And, you know, you're you're coming from US EPA, a regulatory side, uh, you know, you can appreciate probably that when we're looking at the upstream regulatory compliance versus maybe what the influencing factors are, you've got sort of two, uh, two different sets of maybe lenses that you look through. So one of the lenses that we look through also because we're trying to comply with regulatory aspects is that we see those concentrations uh, through those structures are at their there are 11 and 12 parts per billion. And what is the Q-Bell set for the STAs? It's 13, right? So when you look on a spatial temporal average, we're seeing better than STA numbers coming through those structures. So that would be part of the answer of why we see, uh, why we're making a statement that it continues not to be or appear to be a factor. But we also acknowledge what Donato said earlier, that there's probably more work that needs to look, be looked into. Thank you. I understand all that. I guess my question is, though, this presentation, a lot of it focused on 2018 forward. So is it continues not to be a factor since 2018? Continues not to be a factor since since when? I think we've been doing this for the last, this might be the second year in which we've had this slide on there and made that statement. Yeah, they, yeah, prior to this, they were presenting the individual structures, and I think John Madden was the last person to present on the S9 and show that there was a spike in concentrations. But since we've been aggregating, or they've been aggregating these data, we're seeing this presentation for the last two years. Sorry. Okay, and then my last question, and then I'll uh, move on. Then, again, the same statement, upstream influence continues not to be a factor, um, I assume then you mean STA outflow concentration has no influence on inflow phosphorus at Shark River Slough. Is that correct? We're not seeing evidence that the concentrations are high enough that might indicate that there's an effect on Shark River Slough. Taking into account the comments that Donato made and some others made that maybe there are some additional information or some additional um, data analysis or maybe evaluations that need to be done to see whether or not there could be a, a lag factor uh, you know, also maybe on a mass balance perspective, we need to look at it because right now we're just, we're looking at concentrations. Maybe concentrations don't always tell the exact story because it, concentrations have to be tied to magnitude of, of mass. So I, there, we're acknowledging there are some opportunities um, to do some additional um, dives into the information. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay, Bill, you put your hand down and then you put it back up again. So do you have... It's back. <clears throat> yeah, I don't want to get into the legal weeds, but I'm not sure that uh, 
if you make a statement that oh, even if the inflows were not correlated with the Sharp River Slough inflow concentrations, it, it seems to me that there's a requirement in the consent decree to meet the criterion throughout the marsh and certainly for EPA under that separate legal proceeding. But that may be too complicated a question right now, but I, I just want to make that point. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Bill. Uh, Ed, you had your hand up. You put it back down again. Have we covered your comment or question? Well, I, this is, yeah, thanks, Julie. This is Ed Smith, DEP. I just wanted to, you know, Dan was asking about, you know, how long, you know, over the past few years, what does that mean? I had, well, I didn't have, Luke and Mylene took a look at some of the data uh, throughout Water Conservation Area 3. They went back 20 years, and what they saw in those 20 years is, it's, it's, it's a continual decreasing trend at every single site except for one, and, and I can't remember which site it is exactly, but every site has, has shown, especially on the western side, has shown a, a decreasing trend uh, since the last 20 years. So, you know, while, while this, these presentations may only go back the past few years, going back to when John Madden uh, started presenting these, the data goes back much farther and shows that decreasing trend. So, just, just wanted to point that out. And since you are pointing that out, are you talking about structures, marsh stations? I just want to make sure I understand your comment, Ed. It's a combination of structures and marsh stations. Okay, great. Thank you. And Ed, are you suggesting that the concentrations have declined to levels that are protective of the downstream condition? Based I did not trends? say that. No, I did not say that, but I said over the past 20 years, we have seen a continual decrease in concentrations. Thanks for the clarification. Okay, I confess I have not been keeping track. Bill, is your hand still up or did you put it down and put it back up again? I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Does anyone have other comments and questions on the presentation? Okay. Uh, we did post in the read ahead the 2016 memo from the principal. So I do want to ask the TOC reps if you're prepared to look at the three questions or if you wanted to uh, defer that to our next meeting, but let me go through those questions and we can take a look at how we want to handle them. So this is language out of the consent decree. Uh, the first question is whether or not the TOC has sufficiently evaluated the relevant information for a better understanding of what might have caused the exceedance. The second question is, has the TOC determined there is substantial evidence that the exceedance is due to error or extraordinary natural phenomenon. And the third question is if we didn't land with an error or extraordinary natural phenomenon, uh, how we wanted to proceed uh, if we want, had additional remedies that might need to be taken. And I know historically we haven't always gotten to the third question, but... Uh, maybe we could deal with at least error and extraordinary natural phenomenon, and maybe you might want to look at some more data before you uh, take that kind of uh, thought process. Thanks for putting this on the table, Julie. Um, so we did have some concerns about this concept of, of no further upstream influences, and it sounded like there was a potential that something more may be evaluated. Um, I'm not charging you guys with that, but I do know that I need to bring a presentation to the meeting to at least discuss those points. Um, so I, I see at least another meeting uh, coming up that where, where I would give that presentation before I would be ready to uh, try to take a vote on anything. Over. Okay, what about Dan and Ed and and I you know, I think it's okay if we can make a decision on data error or extraordinary natural phenomenon if you all feel you have enough information for that today. 
Hey, Julie, this is Ed. Uh, yeah, for the first two, I think I can say, yeah, there's no no data error and, and we can rule out uh, extraordinary natural phenomenon. I think um, I think it'd be good to see Donato's presentation at the next next meeting. I think that's going to add a lot of insight to uh, what what goes next, what we do next. So I, I think I'd like to hold off on on that if if that's OK with the group. OK, thank you. I want to support Ed's. I agree with the no error, extra um, ordinary natural phenomenon. Thanks, Ed. OK, Lori. I agree with Ed. And what about you, Dan? Hey, good morning, Julie. Uh, yeah, I would make it unanimous. I, I agree. We, you know, with the Corps of Engineers, we're managing the water on a, on a weekly basis. So fully tracking that there's no extraordinary natural phenomena. And I appreciate very much Chelsea's presentation and the discussion of the air. So I would I would echo Ed's conclusions. And I also would appreciate the opportunity to uh, see the presentation from Donato at the upcoming TOC before making any final decisions about next steps. So. Okay, and uh, gosh, we're the ones that presented that we didn't think there was uh, data error or extraordinary natural phenomena. So it sounds like we're all in agreement uh, about where we are, uh, but perhaps we all need to or want to look at more of what's been going on in the data and come back at the next meeting. So uh, I think we got through question number two, at least, all the way. <laughs> all right, thank you. And Chelsea sat down on us. I just want to say thank you. I'm sure that was a ton of work, especially the last um, presentation. So thank you for that. And thank you, Stuart, for filling in a lot, some of the gaps, some of the questions that I had. Okay, are we ready for our next presenter, uh, Ken Bradshaw? I hope you haven't fallen asleep. Oh, man, I'm still here. Are yes. you going to drive the slides for me? Yeah, Diana just walked up. She's going to do the slides for you, so hopefully uh, we'll see those on the screen here for a second. So our next presenter is Ken Bradshaw from the Army Corps. He's going to uh, give us an, a presentation on the Central Everglades Planning Project. So that's SEP uh, on the operational plan. So go ahead, Ken. Okay, thank you, Julie. Good afternoon. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, as Julie said, I'm going to talk about the Central Everglades Planning Project, and this is um, this is an operational plan update. It's not a construction, but it's tied to to the construction efforts that have been ongoing for the the SEP project over the last few years. And so um, we can go to the next slide, just to kind of give a brief uh, overview of what we're going to talk about today. Is is the operational plan overview? Um, we'll talk a little bit about the project scope because we, we have already done um, some of the scoping effort for the NEPA and then lastly uh, a project schedule. And you know really the purpose here is to update the TOC commit or on the development of this operational plan and to kind of talk about how we plan to do this in the future as well as with this plan um, as, as the Corps and the South Florida Water Management District work together on this plan. Um, next slide. One more. Okay, so what are we doing? Uh, we're we're looking at developing operations for SEP infrastructure, and so what that means is we'll be developing a water control plan. Um, we are going to update the draft operating manual to a uh, preliminary project operating manual for SEP, and then um, to do all this, we have to do an environmental analysis. So we'll also produce a, a NEPA document. Uh, that, that looks at what the environmental impacts are of, of the operational plan. And, and as I said before, this is just an operations plan update. It's not pre uh, prescribing any new construction, and so therefore we're not recommending any new infrastructure. And so on the map on the right uh, with the dashed line, it's kind of the, the, set, the area of the Everglades that has uh, that SEP has influence over. And so that's that's sort of the the project area scope from um, basically the EAA down into Everglades National Park. Next slide. So <clears throat> overall, the set purpose is 
um, well, the purpose of the operational plan, and, and this will be done in phases, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, we're going to provide the operational cr criteria for the SEP in infrastructure that has been completed or is near completion, um, along with the completion of the Tamiami Trail Next Steps Phase 2 project. Um, and then the, the update of the SEP operational plan is going to replace the operations plans for the conservation areas, Everglades National Park, and the South Dade Conveyance System, which is basically what everybody knows as the Combined Operational Plan or COP. Um, this will be done in phases. So the first phase of this is, is what we're going to be looking at in, in the upcoming analysis and project. And then future updates will be uh, done as, as additional SEP and, and non-SEP features are completed. Next slide. So just to orient everyone to what SEP is again, it, you don't live and breathe it every day. You probably don't remember what each phase is. Um, but the overall purpose of SEP is to improve the quantity, quality, timing, and distribution of water flows uh, to the northern estuaries, Conservation Area 3, Everglades National Park, and Florida Bay, while also increasing water supply for municipal, industrial, and ag users. Uh, SEP is broken out into four phases. Um, everything, well, the, there's, there's SEP South, which is basically what's um, the southern portion of the system that we've talked about a lot today around the L67 and the Water Conservation Area 3B. Uh, there's SEP North, which are features that are uh, just south of the STA 34 area, if you're looking at the map. Um, SEP New Water is actually on the eastern side, and it's, it's seepage control. And then finally, SEP EAA, which is the EAA Reservoir and the A2 STA. So those are, those are the overall features of SEP. Um, they're all in various stages of construction at this time, both between the, the district and the core. Um, and so the, the phase one is going to look at those projects that are going to be online in the near future. Next slide. So as I said, this is a phased implementation. So we're basically taking the SEP uh, from 2014 and 2020, uh, the draft project operating manuals um, and updating those. There's also uh, in 2020, we looked at um, an EA that did a draft operating a draft project operating manual for the L67 culverts. And finally, 2020, we, we did the combined operations plan that drives the operations of water flows uh, south into the park. So <clears throat> what we are going to do is incrementally progress as we build set features. And so ultimately, uh, we'll start in phase one with the things that are uh, on the ground or will be on the ground here shortly. And through several iterations of, of updates, we'll have a full build-out project manual once all of the SEP com, uh, components are completed. And that's somewhere after 2030, maybe 2031. So this will this effort will happen a couple of times between now and then. So right now, we're in the first phase of that. Uh, you can see we're uh, about in October 2023, not quite yet, but we have just started the, the effort for the, the phase one of SEP operation impl implementation. Next slide. So this slide is just a brief overview of what, what the, the operating manuals and control plans process looks like. So um, just to, to define a few terms of the project operating manuals, they describe uh, operating uh, criteria for SEP Everglades uh, restoration plan projects. The water control plans provide the day-to-day -day operational criteria for water managers. And then the NEPA documents um, describe the proposed action on the surrounding environment. So on the diagram in the right, you just see kind of when we're in feasibility, we develop a draft uh, project operating manual. As we get the construction um, and, and set more refined design, we upgrade that to a preliminary POM. And then ultimately, when we consider the long-term operations and the integrated projects, um, we'll do a final POM. And then there's revisions to that along the way as, as different things change. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, so now we'll just go into what we've gotten um, here recently through the scoping effort. So the project, and, and I have a slide on this in a second, but we, we started scoping of the project, I believe it was in April of this year. Um, and then we got the comments from that, and we've taken an initial uh, cut at what we 
are going to look at in the scope. And so the, the first increment is going to, going to consider the Tamiami Trail's uh, next steps phase two and opportunity to remove the eight and a half foot uh, L29 constraint, um, take advantage of the increased water budget that we anticipate um, the approved uh, Lake Okeechobee system operating manual would provide to the south. Um, incorporate the lessons we've learned over the last few years with COP, also look at S-12 operations and uh, potentially evaluate a transition from a date-based to a condition-based operation. Um, we're going to look at the regulation schedules in conservation areas 2 and 3, 2A and 3A, and then targeted improvements to the Tamiami Trail flow formula um, with the existing and pending infrastructure uh, that we are going to consider in increment one for the, where flows go into the park. And finally, the, um, I think the, over, the, the, the scope is for, pro, for pro projects that will be on the ground and ready um, around 2027. And then, as I said earlier, additional phases of step operational increments will follow this. Next slide. So I'm not going to read through all these uh, in the table, just real quickly go through what are the SERP objectives that SEP will accomplish upon full build out. And the SERP objectives are improving habitat, functional, habitat and functional quality, uh, improving native plant and animal species abundance and diversity. Next slide. Uh, increasing abil availability of fresh water providing recreational navigation opportunities, and protecting cultural and archaeological resources and values. Um, and then the, on the right is the, how the SEP will uh, achieve those objectives. Next slide. So the project constraints, as we always have with SERP, are protection for um, flood risk and water supply, and we have to meet applicable water quality standards. And then again, one of the constraints is the operation limit of 9.7 feet in the L29 canal. So these are all things that we're going to look at as constraints as we're updating the operational plan for step. Next slide. So briefly, I'm just going to talk about what we've done so far in the NEPA and planning process and what's upcoming. So next slide. So NEPA is a federal law requiring the federal agencies to consider environmental impacts of our proposed actions um, and whether or not they have a sig significant effect on the quality environment. So through that, we solicit uh, public views on proposals as well as consult with state, tribal, and local governments. And in particular, we provide agencies with jur jurisdictional responsibilities, a mechanism through NEPA and through um, the, the project delivery team a way to coordinate overlapping areas of responsibility. Next slide. So as I said earlier, what we've done so far is the scoping period. So that ran from April 12th to May 15th. Uh, we, had a, we had three scoping meetings, two in person and one virtual uh, near the end of May where we presented basically this presentation that I'm showing today and uh, asked for public feedback. Um, there was a meeting on the 17th to take that feedback, and the meeting was between the Corps and the district to, to set the initial uh, scope to take the comments that we got and, and kind of outline what our initial scope is going to be. And then there's been biweekly team meetings, too, to continue to develop that scope. The next uh, project delivery team meeting is on June 29th, 2023. Um, if, you're, if you don't have the invite to that, you can email uh, Melissa Nasuti at the email address on the screen, and she can get you an invite to that. And if you want further information on the operational plan, you can click on the link, and that'll take you to the operational plan website. Um, but this is just kind of the overall process for NEPA and a way to, to get into those meetings if you want to be involved. Next slide. So finally, I'll just talk about the schedule. Um, started, I guess we started putting the schedule and everything together earlier this year. Um, you can go to the next slide. And so we've had, um, now we're in the pre-formulation phase, if you look from left to right on this screen. So we'll be taking the scoping comments, or we're, we're taking the scoping comments and, and set up the initial scope. We'll provide uh, and get feedback on that in the project delivery team. 
And then the, the next year we'll be developing the alternatives to basically uh, look look at the, the different alternatives for operations uh, in the SEP operational plan, followed that by optimizing the preferred alternative once it's selected. And then um, in October to May of 24, we should have a draft EIS and a water control plan that's ready for review uh, to be done May to June 2025 with a final um, EIS and final product, hopefully by March of 2026 is what we're targeting for our schedule right now. And with that, I will take any questions. That was the last slide. This is our uh, required we're hiring slide. So uh, I think Dan has his hand up. Dan does have his hand up, but uh, I have to apologize to everybody that we didn't put our own advertisement slide in our presentations. So if you'd, if you'd rather be further south in Florida, come to the district. Uh, Dan, go ahead, please. Thank you, Julie, and, and thank you, Ken. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Ken uh, for uh, offering to provide this kind of presentation. Uh, as he indicated, the the, the next, you know, it's, it's an exciting time for Everglades restoration where we're in the uh, strides of, of completing a lot of construction over the course of the next decade. And the Corps and our partners with the Water Management District and our, our close federal partners with the National Park Service, you know, our interest is to, to maximize ecosystem restoration benefits as we, we move forward with the construction. Uh, and so we expect, as Ken indicated, that there'll be at least two, if not three, increments of operational updates to kind of make sure that we're transitioning the ecosystem to uh, gather additional benefits as these Central Everglades planning project features are completed over the course of the next eight. Uh, we wanted to make sure that as we are on the ground floor of the SEP operational study, it's certainly something that we expect the, the audience here at the Technical Oversight Committee would be interested in tracking, very similar to uh, the approach the Corps and the Water Management District took during the development of the 2020 combined operational plan. And so you can expect the Corps, you know, at appropriate mile posts during the study that will come back to the TOC and kind of keep the TOC informed of the progress. Uh, but since we are on the ground floor of the study, we did just want to by the information that our first project delivery team public meeting is coming up this Thursday. And again, you can uh, certainly email Melissa and CD to uh, get added to the project email list if you'd like to receive the regular updates for every time we have one of these probably monthly in the near term project delivery team meetings. And, and as Ken indicated, the, the project website does have all the information for the upcoming PDT meeting coming up on Thursday. Uh, but we, on behalf of the Corps of Engineers, we appreciate the opportunity to share this information and just kind of maintain transparency within this forum as well. So thank you, Julian. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Dan. And Diana backed up a little bit to show everybody uh, Melissa's email address. And I actually don't know if the PDF of the slides has a clickable link or not, but I know Melissa would be happy to add you as uh, desired to her email list. Any other comments or questions for Ken? Okay, I'm not seeing any raised hands. Uh, Mr. Burkett, your mic has been unmuted and I apologize, I didn't notice the hand raised. I didn't know if you had something you wanted to say before we go to public comment. Uh, you're, you're very astute as always. Um, first of all, I, I wanted to say thank you. I, I thought uh, all the presentations today were really very helpful, very well done. And I thought the comments that were made were also very useful. I'm, uh, I'm interested in, and not much was said, but I'm interested in the status, status of the working group submissions in the letter that was posted um, in the read aheads, uh, I was advised in the in the April letter that, uh, or in the I guess it was the February letter uh, that was posted at the last meeting about submissions that would be made in June by June of this year. One is on a, a study to conclude 
uh, regarding character characterization of sediments and flock in the canals in the marsh adjacent to the park. Another is uh, a study that was supposed to be completed by March on quantifying nutrient concentrations in the canals to assess their contributions to phosphorus loading. And then both of those were supposed to be part of a report that the park was expected to make to the working group in June of 2023. Um, and then I was also told about a hydrodynamic study where findings and recommendations would be made to the working group in June of 2023. I'm just curious, number one, whether all of these submissions have been made and these dates have been satisfied or whether there's been some delay in any of these. Uh, good questions. And I'm looking around the room to see if we could have someone who's officially part of the working group respond. I don't know if Donato or Jody, if you want to say, or Stuart. And I do want to point out, June's not over yet. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Barquette. It's Stuart Van Horn. I had to walk up here um, so I could address your question. It's a pleasure so, to see you again, Stuart. Um, so both teams are making a lot of progress. Um, we're still targeting to, we were hoping by the end of June, but it's probably gonna be like July 1st or so when we have um, <clears throat> the sediment study report is looking like it's gonna shape up to be finalized. It could be plus or minus a few days. The hydrodynamic study might be a little bit longer than that, but not too much longer. Um, <clears throat> you know, basically, these teams are working very hard and diligently to work um, cooperatively together. We've had a number of uh, our series of meetings continue to occur between the team members. Um, and, um, you know, we're doing everything possible to make sure that we get these reports done. So the team has four meetings, I think, scheduled, what we call rapid succession meetings during the month of July, so that um, we are able to, th this initial deadline was for both teams to produce their individual reports. So what we need to do then is combine those reports and synthesize it so that there's a common understanding between both teams. So at, while each team is trying to finalize their reports, we're also trying to review little bits and nuggets of information that's coming from the other team and respond to that. So we, so in, in essence, we are working diligently to try and stay on schedule. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts to this, but um, I mean, I, I think I could say rest assured that by the time we get to September, we're gonna have a complete package with a set of recommendations, which is what our goal was. Well, that's very helpful. I, I, I would never, I would never worry about anybody among these agencies working hard. I, I've watched how hard you all have worked over now, uh, two decades. Uh, so, uh, no concerns there. I, I know the dedication that everybody has towards the success of this project. My only uh, concern is uh, when I've. When I'm dealing with now the third violation in four water years for Shark River Slough, I'm, I'm feeling a sense of, of urgency uh, just personally. And I, uh, I don't necessarily feel a need to, to uh, alert the court to any of this at this point. I, I think we can certainly wait to see what the recommendations look like uh, in September and uh, we can also wait for the next meeting to see whether uh, the TOC has the view and the principals have the view that this latest water year uh, violation is sufficiently uh, similar to the prior two that the working group's list of possible remedies still would be applicable. Uh, I just want to relate to, to everyone that I'm feeling a little uncomfortable um, that we, we don't have a bit more 
substantively given that we've now been, been uh, what, 2019 was 2021, 2022 now, it's been two to three years and uh, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to solve the problems of the Everglades uh, in a sprint because this is not a sprint, it's a marathon, I get that and I respect that, but um, I would appreciate it just personally if, if you could keep moving this along so I could be in a position to be quite comfortable in saying that everybody is doing everything they can to honor their obligations to uh, identify additional remedies in light of the violations. So um, that's, a, that's an, a, an admonition with a love, uh, if, if you can take it that way. But I, I, I want to be in a position to be quite comfortable that I don't need to apprise the court of three violations in the last four years because uh, the consent decree process is working and remedies are going to be implemented. So I, that's the comfort level that I'm looking for. And hopefully by the next meeting, I will have that comfort level. Well, um, Julie, when our next meeting would be scheduled for... Okay. We're going to get to that right after public comments. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Barkett. No, thank yeah. you. Thank you. I'm, I'm the one that's always grateful to all of you, believe me. Okay, do we have any public comments from either here in the auditorium or from the attendees on Zoom? And if you are on Zoom, please raise your hand so I could call on you. I'll give you a moment to figure out how to raise your hand. Thank you for the reminder of how to do this. So if you're uh, on Zoom, you can use star 9 to raise your hand or star 6 to mute or unmute if you're on a phone or there's a hand somewhere you can click on. Just wanted to give everybody a moment. Okay, so I'm not seeing anyone wanting to make public comments. It may be one of our bigger adventures today is to try to figure out when we're going to have our next meeting. Uh, I, For those of you in the room, you can see this multicolored piece of paper I have. This is the adventure in trying to find meeting dates. Uh, we have three dates available uh, in the auditorium in September. None of them are on a Tuesday, so if you're really married to Tuesdays, I'm just warning you now. Uh, we have Friday, September 15th, Monday, September 18th, and Thursday, September 21st as meeting dates here in the auditorium. And if absolutely zero of those work, I did find a few dates in the storage room. Sure, Monday... September 18th, let me back up to Friday, September 15th, and Thursday, September 21st. It turns out the auditorium calendar is extremely busy in the next several months. Is This is John Barquette. Is September 21st uh, compatible with what? with what Stuart Van Horn just suggested, um, that they might have recommendations available by September. Does that put too much pressure on the working group or um, would that date work? It might be. Um, I, I typically on any given day give myself until midnight or the end of business. So if it's the end of September we're looking at, it probably is a little too much pressure. Mr. Barquette, this is Stuart Van Horn again. Um, one thing that we have to consider is that while the team will have its recommendations um, by the end of September, it still it has to go to the principals. So there's you know what comes first, the presentation at the TOC or giving it to the principals, so that they can um, you know go through the material, hear from the team of what the salient points are, 
what direction they want to move and then come back to the TOC. I, that's not necessarily for me to say. I'm just letting you know that that's probably something that's in play. So to factor that in. Uh, yes, no, I appreciate that. And I, and I recognize that that step would have to be taken. I'm sure that the principals feel the same urgency that I feel. Nobody wants to have three violations of a federal consent decree outstanding without some resolution. Um, but I, I leave it, I, the, the 21st would be the best day for me among the days you mentioned. And if, if we can follow that up uh, with a meeting October, November, then that could work. Or if the preference is to wait, I, I know uh, uh, we've heard about a, already a presentation that's going to be made at the next meeting. So I'm, I'm fairly flexible personally. It's whatever all of you think would work best uh, for the process. Mr. Burkett, this is Julia LaMonaco, if I may pipe in a little bit here. Oh, absolutely. If you don't need to ask permission from me. Sure. So um, the principals um, have scheduled a meeting for September 28th um, to have the working group present their recommendations to them. Um, so I think the idea would be to give the principals a chance to look at those recommendations um, and kind of get something in mind of where they want to go, what makes sense, what's feasible. I know that's all part of the um, thought process amongst the working group and the principals, and then bring it back to the next TOC meeting after that um, on where the principals are headed with the recommendations. I think the next TOC meeting is usually, um, usually November is hard, if I remember correctly, because of the Thanksgiving holiday. So I think typically that TOC meeting ends up being the first week of December. And that would be, um, I think, the time that the principals could bring back their recommendations that they've decided to go with. That, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so is there enough substantively to have a meeting in September? If the answer is yes, then Let's schedule something in September. I uh, and I would I would suggest that we also try to schedule the next meeting uh, now, if we can, where we can hear the um, the results of the discussions among the principals. I I was thinking really honestly later in October, early November, but if we have to wait until the first week of December, we'll wait until the first week of December. I do have a few dates for November, December on my shopping list here. Uh, I can share those and then we can uh, decide on a next so-called quarterly meeting because we certainly sounds like we have more work to do on the water year 22 uh, that I would hope we would bring back in September. And then uh, for the dates that we do have available again here in the auditorium, uh, November 21st, December 5th, and December 19th. And those are all Tuesdays for the Tuesday lovers out there. So those would be, so we'd be looking at September dates for a quarterly meeting and further discussion or evaluation of water year 22. And then uh, the three dates I just mentioned, uh, which is uh, the week before Thanksgiving, I think, and the first part of uh, December. So those are November 21st, December 5th, and December 19th. Uh, December 5th. I'll just speak up that December 5th works for me. Uh, November 21st would work for me, and December 19th would also work for me. Okay, great. And for the September dates, I think, Mr. Burkett, you said the 21st works for you. Is that correct? That's the, it's the best date. I could probably make the other dates work, but that's the safest date for me. I'd have to move some things around for the other dates. Okay. Which I, which I will do if it means that that's the only one of those days or the only days that would work for the TOC reps. All three days work for me in September. All days are good for you in September. That's Lori. What about you, Donato? <laughs> 
September 21 works. Okay, Dan and Ed, would you be able to do September 21st? I like September 21st. This is Ed. Uh, got a lot of meetings bookending that, so that's perfect. Oh, great. Thank you. And Julia, this is Dan Crawford. I'm good with the 21st of September as well. All right, so we will plan to have the next quarterly meeting here in our auditorium on September 21st. We will do quarterly reporting, and uh, I think Donato quietly indicated he may bring back a presentation on water year 22, uh, and we'll, we'll see how the agenda flushes out for that. And I would be totally fine if we could choose a date for... Uh, November, December. So those dates are November 21st, December 5th, and December 19th. And I do need to warn everybody, once we pick a date, I'm going to go back and release the other dates. So um, hopefully we can zero in on something that we don't have to change our minds. And just to remind everybody, Mr. Parkett said he could make November 21st, December 5th, or December 19th. The December, the two December dates, this is Lori, work better for me. Okay, thank you. Hey, Julie, this is Ed Smith, DP. Uh, I will uh, second Lori Miller's dates, the December dates. Okay, we're getting there. Everybody wear your Santa Claus suit when you get here. The 5th and 19th of December work for me as well. Work for me as well. Okay, Dan? I'm also good with uh, uh, either of those dates on the 5th or the 19th, Julie. Uh, just acknowledging Mr. Barquette's sense of urgency. If, if all the dates work, maybe we would go with the 5th over. Okay, is everybody all right with December 5th? Hearing nothing else, I believe we've zeroed in on December 5th. So uh, the next two meetings are going to be Thursday, September 21st, and Tuesday, December 5th. And I really appreciate you guys uh, looking at your calendars. That's always a great adventure here. So thank you. May I also request that for the September meeting that we just get an update on the working group's uh, submissions just put that on the agenda, if you would. Thank you. And again, I want to reiterate, I just think everybody's working very hard, and I'm very grateful for that. Thank you, Mr. Barkett. I just want to confirm, Mr. Parquet, you're asking for a similar status as you received today about the submissions that's, from the working right. group, right? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't need to see paper necessarily, just to get uh, an oral update uh, or at least you know two or three slides, just highlighting where, what they've accomplished and what they've submitted, and we'll, we can await the principal's discussion in, in on the December at the December fifth meeting. Okay, thank you. All right, any other comments, questions, anything else? Is this where I say we're always hiring to? Um, sorry. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I didn't see any more hands get raised here, so I appreciate everyone's listening and participation, and we will see you all on September 21st. Thank you.